Good afternoon, my renegades. Welcome back to Rogue Radio. Today is Renegade Times. I mean, if you haven't guessed, I do this more than all of my other episodes. So let's just get right into this. Jump in the trenches with me. We're neck deep today instead of knee deep. So, uh, I don't know, we're swamp pants? Is that what they're called? If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, feel free to click the links down in the description below, get yourself some merch, talk to me, do whatever you like to do, and thank you for those who have actually purchased some of my Down the Rabbit Hole episodes. Just wanted to throw that in there. I see you, I recognize you, and I appreciate you greatly. Thank you so much. And of course, politics is up, and we got some stuff to talk about. We always have stuff to talk about. A, B, C, D, E, F, U, and your label, and your bottles, and your clothes, and your fucking trash bags, what the fuck is that? Fuck you! <laughs> and your pedo photo shoot, bitch you got no class, feel my boot up your ass. That's right, Balenciaga is in the news again. Let's just fucking do this. Oh, I just had to. That song has been in my head for so long, and I don't even listen to it, I don't know the whole song. So I just decided, you know what? This is something that God probably <laughs> made me do. <laughs> oh, no. No, I can't say that, can I? <laughs> I can't use God to do my dirty work. Sorry. Uh, okay, Balenciaga is, has first runway show since BDSM-themed photo shoot scandal. So Balenciaga held its first... Runway show since the photo shoot scandal that included children holding teddy bears and BDSM themed attire. The fashion house, the fashion house's fall 2023 show um, in Paris on Sunday was noticeably different with no celebrity guests or theatrics of any kind, the New York Times reported. I don't even like her clothes. Like, I see the picture. Like, who the fuck would wear this shit? I mean, Kim K, of course, but... <laughs> Let's see. The event was held at the old Carousel du Louvre in a portion of the, me- the museum within plain white spaces, okay? The fashion designer, who goes by the name Demma, went back to just clothing the items offered included trousers as trench coats trousers as trench coats interesting okay puffers and denim leather jackets okay let's see here there were long flowing floral numbers some which with sleeves almost hitting the floor yeah that's not sanitary like can you imagine eating with a sleeve like that you're gonna just bring the rest of your dinner home with you. You don't need a box. Some with sleeves hitting the floor. Okay, and lastly, the designer offered shimmering evening floor-length gowns in silver and black. In a Balenciaga show um, note shared on Twitter, Demna, oh, Demna, whatever, wrote that fashion can no longer be seen as an entertainment. So, we're gonna read this bullshit note. If I- if Twitter will let me. Cause I really don't wanna read the small text. I don't know why I have so... low energy today. No reason whatsoever. Okay. I was six years old when my parents let me have a pair of pants. 
uh, made for me by a neighbor, Taylor. Um, I designed them, chose the fabric for them, and fabric, or in a fabric shop, and went to the tailor twice for fittings. Um, this was the very beginning of my love affair with clothes, and predefined, yeah, predefined my relationship with them, and made, stop it, made me want to become a designer. Okay, fashion has become a kind of entertainment, but uh, often, um, that part overshadows the essence of it, which lays in shapes and volume silhouettes um, the way we create relationships between body and fabric, the way we make shoulder lines and armholes, the way clothes have an ability to change us. Okay. Um, in the last couple of months, I needed to seek shelter uh, for my love affair with fashion, and I instinctively found it in the process of making clothes. It reminded me, once again, if it's an amazing power to make me feel happy and truly express myself. This is why fashion, to me, can no longer be seen as entertainment, but rather the art of making clothes. Ma'am... I don't care how you spin it, ma'am, sir, whatever you are, okay, you put kids in on display with BDSM garb and a whole bunch of other shit, and you haven't actually apologized. I don't see... uh-uh, sorry, once an asshole... Once a proud asshole is still always a proud asshole in show business. That's just my opinion. Alright. I mean, you know how I feel about pedophilia. That was just pedophilia displayed in fashion. And I don't forgive pedophiles. I never will. And I never have. Is that something that I truly need to learn? Yes. But, um, for now, no. I don't forgive Balenciaga for doing that shit. They knew what they were doing. And they are trying so very hard to let you know that they've changed when they probably haven't. They're probably drinking baby's blood right now, you know. Anthony Fauci. <coughs> now listen, his name's cursed if I start coughing, man. Stop. Man, this boy's in the news. We haven't heard from him in a long time. Wish he would just stay underground with all the maggots and the worms that he's been, you know, fucking around with. New emails show he prompted paper to shoot down Wuhan, Wuhan, I can't, I can't, Wuhan lab, uh, theory of COVID-19. Okay, let's just get into this, man. Um, U.S. Energy Department reportedly concluded that the, co the COVID virus likely leaked from a lab in Wuhan, China, even though the agency and it was a low confidence conclusion. The pronouncement... Um, elevated the once conspiracy theory and appeared to vindicate those who had at least questioned the virus's origin. Dr. Anthony Fauci, he's not a doctor, uh, the government's leading infectious disease expert, no he's not, uh, had long sought to sell the idea that the virus emerged naturally. Viruses don't usually just emerge naturally. They're either communicable, which means they they spread from person to person, or something happens. Okay? Like the Wuhan lab experiment, which I don't even think is real either. You know, I think it was created, but I think it was... I don't think it was China, to be honest. I don't know. It could be. But in April 2020... 
He cited a study that found the virus's mutations are consistent with the jump of a species of an animal from an animal to a human. Isn't that what we said AIDS was back in the day? Like it came from infected cows and gorillas from Africa? Now listen, I'm not saying that to sound racist. Go back in the 2000s if you can, like, and find some sort of article that actually had something like that. Because when the AIDS outbreak, like, came about, I know it happened in the 70s, but in the 2000s it became a big deal because it started, like, spreading rapidly again. So, um, yeah, that's how I know. I'm a 90s baby. I just remember hearing that AIDS came from infected gorillas and cows, like, in Africa. And I, I don't know why they're blaming Africa, to be honest, because it, it could have come from anywhere and they chose Africa. But that's, I don't think it came from that either. That's just the rumors that I heard when I was a kid. So, there was a study recently, Fauci told reporters on April 17th, 2020, when asked if, the, if it was possible that the virus came from a Chinese lab where a group of highly qualified evolutionary vir virologist, virologists, yeah, okay, I just said it right, looked at the sequences in bats and they evolve and the mutations. Yeah, okay. Uh, that it took to get to the point where it was now totally consistent with the jump of the species from an animal to a human. So, the paper will be available. I do not have the author right now. But we can make it uh, available to you, Fauci said. Okay. But now, new emails revealed by House Republicans show that uh, a completely different story. The emails... Fauci prompted uh, that were very that the very study to disprove the theory that the virus leaked from a lab in Wuhan, China. In fact, uh, he had final approval of the scientific paper and had it commissioned. The New York Post reported the paper entitled "The Proximal Origin of SARS-CoV-2" was delivered to Fauci for final approval before it was published in Nature uh, magazine or Nature Medicine in uh, February 17th of 2020. The paper was written four days after Fauci and the NIH boss Francis Collins held a call with the four authors to discuss reports uh, that COVID-19 may have leaked from a Wuhan lab, may have been intentionally genetically manipulated, the Post wrote. The House Oversight Subcommittee um, examining COVID released emails on Sunday uh, that show the paper's co-author, Dr. Kristen Anderson, uh, said Fauci prompted him to write the paper with the scientific goal to disprove the lab leak theory. There has been a lot of speculation, fear-mongering, and conspiracies put forward in this, pl in this space. I don't think you guys know yet, but it is something that I probably shouldn't say, but I'm gonna say it anyways, because if FEMA camps doesn't get me, me talking about FEMA camps doesn't get me arrested or put on the watch list, I don't think this will. Listen, COVID-19 was snake venom. How they administered it to thousands of people globally, I have no idea. But there are toxinologists out there that store venom, and if they have enough, they could kill a mass of people. Which is also a genocide, guys. Just saying. I still have to watch the uh, documentary Watch the Water, and I think it's on Rumble. I could, I could go ahead and watch the rest of that. And to be honest, when I started watching that documentary, my phone turned off for about 10 minutes. So, anybody who want to watch the water, like, watch, watch the water, 
go ahead. I'm just saying, your phone's gonna act fucking weird later on. Anderson wrote February 12, 2020 in a cover letter when submitting the paper to Nature magazine. He said paper. the paper was prompted by uh, Tony Fauci and Jeremy Ferrer. Ferrer was then the head of the British nonprofit, uh, the Wellcome Trust, which has long ties to the pharmaceutical industry. On the day... The paper was published. Emails a uh, show Ferrer, Ferrer, Farrar, Ferrer. Published for an edit, but the piece or to the piece. Uh, sorry to miss to micromanage, micro edit. Uh, but would you be willing to change one sentence? Uh, he wanted to change the word unlikely with improbable. Oh my God! Really. <laughs> So the sentence would read, It is improbable that SARS-CoV-2 emerged through laboratory um, manipulation of an existing SARS-related coronavirus. That's how he got rich. He got rich by one word, y'all. And it's all China money. That makes sense, though. But I still think that it's snake venom. You know, but... That wasn't the case at all. In a newly updated classified intelligence report, the Department of Energy asserted that the COVID virus most likely came from laboratory leak in China, according to CNN. <laughs> Fuck CNN. A senior use intelligence official told the Wall Street Journal that the update to the intelligence assessment was conducted in light of new intelligence, further study of academic literature, and consultation with experts outside government. The issue is far from over. We need to do extensive hearings, Senator Dan Sullivan says. A member of the Senate Armed Services Committee and said on NBC's Meet the Press. I hope our Democratic colleagues in the Congress can support that. I know the Republicans in the House are certainly supportive of that, he said. I think about what just happened over the last three years, uh, one of the biggest pandemics in the century. So, a lot of evidence that is coming from the Chinese. The views expressed in the piece are the author's own. Okay, we're done. They gave me a disclaimer. Hello, my renegades. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform called... Spotify for podcasters, and it's all for free, and you can edit from your phone or computer all in one place. No matter what your setup looks like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available, and if you want, you can do Q&As and polls with your audience to get them involved. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and subscriptions. Best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I started using Spotify for Podcasters, I've learned that my voice is heard in many different platforms, and I absolutely love it. So download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Let's have some fun, renegades! All right, here comes the random section of the episode. Let's do it. Ah. So, I wanted to 
say this in the beginning of the episode, but I just want to kind of rant a little bit because, you know, it's, it's, it's my podcast, so why not? I don't really need to give anybody an explanation. But why is it that a lot of mental health organizations keep people mentally ill in the mental health industry, like the mental health organizations in America? It doesn't have to necessarily be where I'm at. I have problems with my work as well. Um, and I hate that I have problems with my work because I love my work. I feel like I am making a small difference in people when they come into the center and they talk to me and I teach them things and they teach me things too. I mean, I I love people that come in. I, I have learned to love people again because of this job that I have as a recovery coach and it just sickens me to my core that some people would rather keep people sick mentally ill for a fucking paycheck I'm not okay with that (laughs) I'm really not okay with that so I have already talked about my testimony about my mental health that but like even the medicine the medicinal industry like the pharmacist the pharmacist the pharmacy industry big pharma all of that shit they they want to keep you stuck they want to keep you mentally ill okay we're going to talk about mental illness not physical illness just because when it comes to that i I'm kind of on the fence when it comes to stuff like that, just because I know there's holistic ways to heal the body. There's definitely holistic ways to heal the mind as well. But when it comes to mental illness, when it comes to the mind of a person, it it's very complex. It's very interesting to see people in in different situations in life and everything like and how they react to certain things i that's i've fallen in love with mental health i've i've i really want to pursue that you know in my life one day um but the industry is so toxic it is so toxic to the point where Part of me does want to leave because of the way they treat clients and the way that they treat, you know, people who are being treated by therapists or pharmacists or whatever. And I'm just like, if you don't care about them, why the fuck are you in this field? If you don't want to go the extra mile for someone because you love people in that way, then why the fuck are you doing it? When it becomes a chore instead of a passion, you need to fucking go away. You need to go find your passion again. Because all of our passions, they change. My passion has always been mental health. And I'm so glad that I got this job as a recovery coach. I feel lucky, but... When it comes to mental health, it's like... You either get somebody who really cares a lot for you or they don't give a shit about you. They're just here because of the pay. There are some very toxic people in the mental health industry. I, I've only been in it for three years and there are some very toxic motherfucking people. I just can't name names and that's fine. It's just... And the thing is that a lot of people in the mental health industry are actually mentally ill, but have kind of leveled up in their recovery long enough and enough to go ahead and start helping people, which is fine. I'm a walking testimony of that. I was diagnosed with OCD and depression and all that stuff. But if you don't care enough 
to see where you've been and love the people who you who are there where you used to be and you want to help them like you don't belong here you don't belong in the mental health industry or the industry I hate saying that how the fuck am I supposed to say that in the mental health area okay because mental health is an industry it is a big thing it is a big earner just like you know, the pharmacists, the big pharma, and all that stuff. Alright. It is a thing. I believe that it is an industry. But there are really good-ass people in the mental health industry. But... If you don't care enough... You, sh you don't belong here. You don't belong in the mental health... Area. Okay, you just don't. You don't belong in the mental health business. If you are not willing to help someone grow in order for them to grow by themselves at some time in their life and to where they don't have to be dependent on medication and therapy all of their lives, then you don't belong here. You really don't want to help somebody. You just want a paycheck. Alright? Mental health, to me, mental illness is always going to be there. Unfortunately, that's just a fact of life that a lot of us have to understand that mental illness is always going to be there. So why not actually help somebody get unstuck from their mind? Why not actually help them grow instead of actually teaching them to be dependent on you and be dependent on a therapist, a doctor, all of that? Me? Okay? I said, I'm a walking testimony. I used to be very antisocial. I still am, to a point. Because I can... I can call BS on somebody very quickly. Because of what they are to me. I don't know. It, it's weird. It's a weird sense that I have. If someone gives me a bad vibe, I don't want to be around them. That is very close. Holy shit. And we're gonna let the sirens disappear. <sighs> this is gonna take a while. Ambiance of Toledo, y'all. <laughs> this is the background noise that you'll hear all the time. I even lost my train of thought. But uh, yeah, like I said, I'm a I'm a walking testimony. I'm I'm still growing, and I still want to do much more than I am now, you know. But when it comes to like medication and therapy and stuff like that, it's just it's awful that people have to turn to that because of what society has told us. Oh, you should take medication to feel normal. What the fuck is normal, for one thing? Two, who the fuck are you to say that they should be normal? Okay? I just feel like there are holistic ways that we haven't discovered yet about mental health and how to preserve the mind in a calm way. It doesn't necessarily have to be normal. Like I said, what the fuck is normal? Everybody's mind works just differently. And sometimes people come into my, um, in, into the center and I sit down and talk with them and I start realizing how their mind works and it's fucking beautiful. Why would you take that away from somebody? Like, some people, their minds work so beautifully. To me, I don't think it's a... Like, some people who come in, their minds are so beautiful. Why would you take that away? Why would you take that away? One of these days, me and my husband are going to sit down on a Let's Talk um, episode. 
talking about how mental mental illness is masking the prophetic in people. And that's something that I highly believe in because I've spent three years in the mental health business and I'm still working to, <laughs> to you know, get more years in. But the fact is, is that some people have come in and they have prophetic traits and I'm just like, no wonder. No wonder. This is a spiritual thing too. I mean, I just want to sit here and get it all out. Like, this is, this is interesting. This is interesting. This is very... There's something there. There's a reason why Elijah got depressed after Jezebel threatened to kill him. Have you ever not read a prophet in the Bible that didn't go through something mentally? Or even a disciple? I mean, mental illness has always been there, even in the Bible. Even in the Bible. So no one can really tell me that the mental illness is a weapon by Jezebel in order to mask and water down the prophetic in people. That's incredible. So Jezebel needs all of this. The spirit of Jezebel needs all of this. The pharmacies, the mental health industry, the organizations, and and the pills, and the therapy, and all of that. All in order to get people to stop reaching their full potential. That's exactly what that is. And I know I'm the only person that thinks that, especially in the business that I'm in. But like I said, mental illness... Damn, what the fu- I'm about to disable your horn, ma'am. Mental illness will always be there, so why not actually help them for real? That's what I'm trying to say. Just like racism will always be there. Unfortunately, it will always be there. Hate will always be there. So will mental illness. It's a fact that I've learned will, you know, I believe that a person can recover from a mental illness. A lot of doctors and therapists and people in the mental health industry, they don't, they don't want anyone to know that, but I've recovered. I don't have the same traits that I used to when I was younger, when I was diagnosed with OCD and depression. And I'm so happy that I don't. And I'm comfortable with talking about it because I'm out of it now. I may have talked about this in one of my testimony episodes, I don't remember. But they gave me so much medication once I was diagnosed with these two mental illnesses that they prescribed me with Abilify, which made me sleep all of the time. They gave me Paxil, which messed up my hormones, and I wasn't allowed, like, it didn't allow my body to have and feel certain things. I'm gonna make it vague, okay? Um, it also made me gain weight rapidly. Um, so those two were canceled out. I don't remember the last one that they gave me before they just set me with the two that I'm about to talk about later in this. Um, but that one just made me feel like a zombie. I just remember that. Like, I remember the three medications that they gave me that they tried to experiment with me. Like, that's basically what it was. They were experimenting to see how my mind and my body would react to these medications because they didn't actually know. They didn't actually know what medication was right for me. They prescribed me experimental drugs. <laughs> And when I say it's experimental, is that they experimented those drugs on me, okay? Um, when I when I say that, it means, yes, these are real medications, they're not experimental, but they experimented on me with them. Just to see how my mind reacted and all of this other stuff. So, when they found out that the two pills that I really needed was Zoloft and Respiradol, okay? 
Zoloft, if you don't take it a lot, um, they, they don't take it consistently, you don't take it every day, your mood will go up and down. Your mood will, you'll have mood swings without it. Which to me, now that I'm talking about it, it gave me a dependency. I was dependent on that drug. Because if I accidentally forgot a medication one day, or if I forgot this medication one day, I would be extremely rude and I would shout at everybody. I'd be very angry and moody and all that. Okay. It's been a thing I've noticed. <laughs> um, but when I did take it, I was regulated. I was well-mannered and all that other stuff. But it shouldn't make me feel a, a certain way if I don't take it. You know what I mean? So at some point, I stopped taking Zoloft. Because of that, uh, probably because of that dependency. It just didn't sit right with me that if I kept taking it, that I would be regulated. But if I didn't take it, it would make me worse. That doesn't sound like a medication. That doesn't sound like it's making me better. That doesn't sound like it's actually helping me. It's not. It, that will never help me. The next one is Respiradol, which helped me with racing thoughts because it, it just was really hard for me to think straight because intrusive thoughts was my company in my brain. It, it always happened. Every day I would have at least two million thoughts go through my head and I would recognize each and every one of them. A normal brain or a neurotypical brain if you want to get scientific or, you know, neuro neurologic with it, <laughs> if that's even a word. Um, usually a normal brain will, you know, have these thoughts and they don't necessarily recognize them every day because we think everything. We think about everything every day, so it doesn't make a difference if we forget a thought because it's not necessarily on our radar to recognize every thought. With me, at some point in my life, I ended up realizing that I had terrible thoughts. I had thoughts of hurting myself, hurting other people, all this other stuff. And I recognized each and every thought. Each and every thought I had every single day, every second of the day, 86,400 seconds of the day, I had racing thoughts. And I recognized each and every one of them. I looked at them and I said, why am I thinking this way? There's something wrong with me. And the reason why they prescribed me with Respiradol is because it slowed down those thoughts. But lo and behold, because of that one medication slowing down my thoughts and having given me peace, to be honest, because there are times when, I, yeah, it was helpful. It was very helpful. I remember having thoughts Every single day, I recognized them, but I didn't react to them. That was my problem beforehand. If I didn't take that medicine, I reacted to every single thought. But, how do I say this? Lo and behold, in order to get something that you wish for, there's always a price. It sounds like witchcraft to me. Isn't it funny that if you talk to a psychic or you talk to some sort of spiritual advisor out there that practices witchcraft, right? They tell you all about your life and what's going on and what you should do and all that stuff, but because of that, there's a price, you know, there's a price for that. You pay a price for looking past the veil. Kind of sounds like the symptoms of medication as well. Where, oh, we're gonna slow down your thoughts, but we're gonna fuck up your hormones later on. Oh, if you're a man, we're gonna slow down your thoughts, but we're also gonna give you breasts. Because, for some reason, it ups the estrogen levels in men to where they grow breasts. Oh, we're going to help you not feel 
sad, but we're also going to give you mood swings if you don't keep taking your medication. Sounds like witchcraft to me. All I'm saying is that I won't stand and watch people that come into my center, or not my center, it's not mine, but on my shift, I'm not going to let somebody stay stuck. I'm going to do everything that I can to help them. I'm not going to let them stay stuck. I'm not going to earn a paycheck without me doing the best I can. Because that's all I can do, is the best I can. And anybody who doesn't do their best doesn't care enough. Especially those who have gone through stuff like this, and you don't care anymore, and you're still working in the mental health organizations. Why are you here? That's a shame. You lost your passion. You need to quit your job. Give room to people who actually fucking care about these people. Go find your passion again. Man. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of all of the interruptions today. Okay, so this one kind of was, was kind of interesting, so we're gonna go ahead and do this if uh, it will let me. Iconic Disneyland attraction is permanently damaged. <laughs> An iconic attraction in Disneyland Resort was permanently damaged. If you've been to Disneyland Resort, you know that it's known for the happiest place on earth. Sure. Um, two theme parks designed, uh, I'm sorry, two theme parks, Disneyland and Disney California Adventure Park. Uh, sorry. As well as the dining district in downtown Disney are available for guests to enjoy on a daily basis. Whether you're a thrill rider wanting to enjoy attractions like the in Incredicoaster, Star Wars Rise of the Resistance, Matterhorn, Bobsleds, Radiator Springs Racers, and Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout, or if you're one of the more nostalgic fans who enjoys um, Reliving your childhood on iconic attractions such as It's a Small World, Jungle Cruise, and Pirates of the Caribbean. There is something for everyone. Okay. Just get to the damn point. <laughs> of course, one of the most iconic attractions at Disneyland Park is an opening is an opening day original haunted mansion. Why well, haven't a haunted mansion? It takes uh, the theme park guests to an eerie journey through a mansion with 999 happy haunted. But there's always room for a thousand if there's any volunteers. So, during the holiday season, which begins in September with the start of Disneyland's Halloween celebration and runs through the new year, Haunted Mansion transforms the Haunted Mansion holiday, which gives a uh, gives us a look at the attraction taken over by Jack Skellington from the beloved Tim Burton animated film, The Nightmare Before Christmas. Despite all these changes and much more, one small area of damage um, has stayed the same. A small bullet hole size damaged spot on the glass at the attraction, uh, which has been inside the ride for years. Disney covered up this damage with a spider and it remains here to this day. And yes, it's a real bullet hole. Who tries to fire a gun at the, in the most happiest place on earth? Like. How do you do that? How in the world did you get past security with a gun? 
While many rumors and stories surrounding the spooky spider are uh, found on the internet, reporters indicate that someone uh, in the summer of 1974, a guest, entered the Southern California Haunted Mansion with a 22 caliber rifle and reportedly shot at the ghost. What? <laughs> Shot at the ghost! Though some fans call for the attraction spot to be repaired, it hasn't happened yet, and it doesn't seem that Disney will ever look to repair that spot, and why should they? The blemish on the attraction may be a spot of permanent damage, but it's actually uh, become... It became a fun talking point for many die-hard Disney fans and Disney adults as they enjoy the ride. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Man, listen. All I want to know is why the fuck did he have to- I want to know the reason why he decided to shoot the ghost. I want to know, man. Was this guy high on crack or something? Like, I need to know. I need the whole story. So, I don't know why I didn't think of this sooner. But, you know I'm a conspiracy theorist. You know I love conspiracies. So, why not give you a little taste of it on Renegade Times? You know? I always love listening to Glitch in the Matrix stories because I've been a victim of it before, um, just a little bit. Um, and nothing too nuts, really. Uh, just like some minor details have changed throughout my life, and it's weird. Um, I guess for one example is that when I was a kid, I was attacked by a dog, and I had 13 to no, not 15 to 17 stitches in my face. Um, the bottom of my left eyelid tore, and I had to wear an eye patch for a while, like I was seven. And because of this, it's been burned in my memory what kind of dog it was. Because I remember it was a collie. So if you guys don't know what a collie is, think of Lassie, like that long-haired, brown, black, and white dog. You know, it was a collie dog. So, every time I mention... <coughs> man! <laughs> every time I mention uh, the time that I've got attacked by a dog, because it was the most craziest memory of my life. Like, it was nuts. Everybody says that it was a Siberian Husky that attacked me. I'm like, no, it wasn't. It was a... It was a uh, Kali, everybody believes, everybody else in my family believes that it was a husky instead of a Kali. And I was like, no, I remember it very clearly that it was a Kali. And the reason why, okay, when I was a kid, I just didn't know any better, okay? Now, I mean, now that I'm an adult, I wouldn't have done this, but, um, I have a cousin, I have two cousins, and I used to hang out with them all the time. So, Whenever uh, we were outside playing in the backyard, we would always see our neighbor's dogs, or their neighbor's dogs. And we were allowed to jump the fence and pet them. Like, we were allowed to do that. So, um, it was the 90s that no one really cared. But uh, the dog's name was Chelsea. And Chelsea had puppies. And the reason why she attacked me is because when she, like, she was caring for her puppies when I... Um, lifted the flap like in like over the hole like the entrance of the doghouse and she thought that I was trying to threaten her puppies and that's fine she was being territorial I understand that now like the dog wasn't vicious it was being defensive over her puppies and that's fine <laughs> but um that's the main reason why I ended up getting attacked I was seven I didn't know the nature of dogs yet so you know it was a mistake it was a horrifying mistake, but a mistake nonetheless. But it's been burned in my memory that this dog was a collie. It always was a collie. Everybody believes and swears up and down 
that what that it was a Siberian husky. So, has something glitched within my family, personally, or maybe somehow the breed of the dog has decided to change? It's just small stuff like that. Um, there have been. There has been a very strange occurrence one time when I was driven home from school um, a long time ago. I was uh, in Paul Mitchell uh, in cosmetology. I was being driven home uh, by a friend. And it was midnight at the time because I stayed very late. (laughs) But I remember that two cars drove on the wrong side of the road like uh, two cars were on either side either either side of our car so um, it was strange and it, it just it looked like they just appeared out of nowhere like I was looking somewhere else and then all of a sudden they were there and they were both driving very slowly slower than the speed limit and they were both similar cars, just came out of nowhere. And I tried to look because I was like, wait, this is a glitch. It has to be a glitch. Something inside me was like, this is a glitch. I'm living in a glitch. And the their heads were turned like I couldn't see their faces. Like they didn't want to be seen. But yes, that is my glitch in the Matrix experiences. But... I know those aren't very interesting, so I'm going to go find one for y'all to just nibble on. Okay, I found one, and I really like it. I really like it. Um, this is a lot different than all the other stories that I've read about the glitch in the Matrix. This one's kind of different. So, one day, I was walking to work, and all of a sudden, I had an urge to walk a different path than usual. I worked downtown in a big city. It was a strange spur-of-the-moment urge to walk a different way that changed my life forever. I turned into an alley that I had never seen before. As I remember it, I made it about 15 feet in or so when an actual glitch happened. Everything in my mind scrambled. I felt like I didn't have a body anymore. I just was a semi-conscious entity floating through some weird dimension. All of a sudden, in an array of different colors and shapes, a vision came to me. It was a bunch of strange-looking people uh, that in my mind resembled businessmen in suits. They looked startled and panicked that I could see them. One of the people made a quick movement, and uh, everything turned to black. When I regained normality, I was on a completely different street. It was the same street that I always used to walk to work. I felt sick and severely disturbed and depressed. Uh, I've never done any hard drugs, never experienced any hallucinations, never have had anything like this happen to me. The weird thing is is that when the glitch was correcting itself, I could see those people watching me like a caged animal. I had the feeling that I knew I was being controlled. It still bothers me uh, very much to this day. That's strange. Okay, here's another one since that one was so short. So, let us read. Someone, hang on, my god. Someone recalls their dad having a, a little toy monkey that he used to teasingly say was his favorite child. It was an ongoing joke. This person and their siblings would try to steal the monkey playing up into it. One day, they got a hold of the monkey and drew all over it with a sharpie, then drew it, and then threw it in the garbage. They laughed when their dad searched for it, but he gave up and he figured uh, they'd thrown it out. A few years later, this person was walking down the street in Toronto when they saw an orange object in this on the side of the road. They walked up to it and it was the exact same toy monkey. Black sharpie lines and all. Uh, This person is still stunned, unable to figure out how this is possible when their garbage 
is sent to a local dump that's nowhere in near Toronto. I mean, somebody could have really just taken it and thought that it was interesting, but then again, like, that is still weird. Like, what are the chances? Okay, the guys who lost an hour of their life. Oh, Lord. As a dude... I mean, a dude. <laughs> a dude was in their car uh, with a couple of friends heading home from a road trip. His parents re uh, his parents called to see how far away uh, he was, and he told them he'd be about 24 minutes. Shortly thereafter, he came around the bend and saw a full moon, which uh, he would... <sighs> Hang on. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Shortly thereafter, he came around the bend and saw a full moon, which was reflected in the lake below. The road ahead was completely empty, not a single car in sight. Suddenly, everything went pitch black for a moment. Uh, no dashboard lighting, no headlights on the road, no music. Then the music was back, with the CD playing from the beginning, and there was a vehicle being pulled over by a cop car, by a cop, a quarter mile ahead. Though it hadn't been there a split second earlier. See, that's kind of what happened to me. Like, those cars were there in a split second. But he assumed that he'd momentarily fallen asleep. Uh, but after a few moments, the driver of the car exclaimed that he thought he'd just fallen asleep as well. Uh, they shared the experience, and more concerning uh, was the clock, which was reading an hour later than it had a bit earlier. Uh, to avoid freaking out, they convinced themselves that the car may have uh, had an electrical failure that reset the clock. Uh, but then they arrived at his house 25 minutes later. Uh, he was an hour late. So... Uh, to this day, he has no idea how to explain the brief blackout and missing hour. Wow. Let's see, one more. At age 10, someone was in the parking lot with their parents, and they looked up at a nearby house and saw a teen in the window. The teen waved, and the 10-year-old waved back. It felt like they somehow knew each other. Ten years later, this person was visiting their grandmother's house, um, and they looked out a window and realized it was the house overlooking the same parking lot from years ago. Then a girl around ten years old in the parking lot waved at them. It felt like they knew each other, the person couldn't explain it, and was left feeling freaked out. Yeah, that is kind of weird. Anyway, the woman with roses. Uh-oh. Okay. A guy was waiting to catch a train when a woman with glazed eyes asked him for money. The fuck? Okay. She said that her brother was in the hospital and she wanted to buy him some flowers. Despite suspicions of... Uh, what she would do with the money he grudgingly gave her five dollars eventually his train uh, pulled up and he got on as uh, it pulled away uh, he saw the woman through the glass asking other people for money to fund her roses his train arrived at the station for 15 minutes later um, he walked to his bus stop and right on time his bus was arriving he hoped he hopped on and read the paper for five to ten minutes, and then the bus made a routine stop. The doors opened, and guess who walked on? None other than the woman from earlier, with a dozen roses in hand. Uh, she looked him right in the eye as she passed by to take a seat. He was stunned, unsure how it was possible that she had time to get flowers and arrive there. Uh, he caught the train before her and saw her as uh, he pulled away, then caught the first and only bus going that particular direction. The mystery went unsolved with no explanation. Wow. The unexplainable boiled egg. Okay, this, is, this has to be the last one because I don't know how much time I have left. So, um, a man described an occasion with 
which he went to grab breakfast at a small buffet um, at his job every morning. The kitchen was deserted as he went to a ceramic egg tray that contained 12 warm, fresh, boiled eggs. He took, uh, he took one and went to a nearby garbage bin to peel off the shell. Then he returned, or then he turned around, stunned. There were 12 eggs in that tray again. Nobody had entered the room while he was peeling, yet this quantum egg was inexplainably reappeared. I would still eat the egg. <laughs> like, that's a galactic egg. Like, eat it. Eat it, bruh. Just eat the egg. Eat the other egg, too, because you know what? Who knows? Alright. I'm done. I usually don't do this, but I am going to have to let you guys go. I will see you in the trenches next time. I did do two stories each. Um, I'm, I'm just going to have to leave it at that. So thank you so much for listening. Bye-bye.